Let the church say amen. amen. Let the church say amen again. Amen. Let the church say amen one more time. Amen. God is always good. In the midst of struggle. But God is the best in the midst of a struggle. There is no one else. I would rather want to go to war with. in a hellified world than with the God of hosts, the God of Jesus Christ, yeah. who sent that son to proclaim to the world that the time has come for the oppressed to be liberated. For the downtrodden and the marginalized to find their place in a new kingdom. A kingdom that is no longer marred by special privileges and what we theologians call hegemonic relationships. And that is relationships where one group of human beings dominates another group of human beings and actually uses the word of God, no less, to make that dominated group think that their suffering is somehow redemptive. And this is the world in which we live. Wesley Chapel, good morning. Good morning. Giving honor to Pastor Hooker. Um, thank you for that introduction, my brother. Um, I didn't know who you were talking about there for a minute. <laughs> but I appreciate you for those kind words. And I just want to say in response to all of you that you all know that you do not have a, a traditional pastor in Reverend Amiri Hooker, and I mean that in the highest sense of compliments. In this place where I'm currently standing has presented to you as congregations either revolutionaries who are unconditionally concerned about your freedom or jacklegs who are only interested in exploiting you. And in my lifetime, I've seen those two extremes. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so upset. As your pastor used the upset adjective. Um, but I did share a platform with him at the NAACP Regional Convention in Columbia. And he struck me as someone who was not just an anecdotal shallow preacher. But he struck me as someone who had a tremendous amount of depth and a tremendous amount of scholarship to the task that he engaged as a minister and as a servant in the community. I got an email from him about 10 months ago in the midst of finishing up my last manuscript. And the email said, I want you to look over this manuscript that I have finished. And I 
I can confess among all of you now, I really didn't want to do it at that time. <laughs> because I was nearing a publication deadline, but I got around to doing it and opened it up and I was amazed at the breadth of sources and at the depth of scholarship that I saw in the manuscript that's out now and has become preaching in the midst of a tri-pandemic. I was honored to be one of the first to read that manuscript and still honored to be one of the first to read that manuscript. And if any of you don't have it or haven't read it, I strongly recommend that you get it and read it. These are not the types of issues and words that pastors usually write about. And there's a depth of inspiration as well as scholarship in it that I think that you would greatly benefit from if you purchased it and read it. Brother Mary Hooker, give your pastor a round of applause. I am happy to share with you on your 136th anniversary as a church. If my math is correct, that means that the foundation was built in 1885, in the midst historically of post-reconstruction, in the midst of a time when black people had just experienced the most progressive transition in its entire existence in America, Reconstruction, and the forces of white supremacy had gotten together in the 1876 election in 1877, removed federal troops from the South, Wade Hampton, racist governor of South Carolina, shut the University of South Carolina out to African-American students, including all of its professors, to include one Richard T. Greener. And so it came along at a time where crisis was about to revisit us once again. And there's not a better time for a church to become a church than in the midst of a crisis. We have not been strangers to crises as black people. And to proclaim that you want to be a church in Lake City, South Carolina, in 1881 is indeed an act of tremendous courage. For the creation of a church itself is an act of liberation. Yes, sir. It is an act and a declaration of God's promise to, to all human beings to realize the freedom inherent in human existence itself. But more than that, to proclaim a victory over the forces of hell is indeed an act of liberation. We are in a similar situation, and I'll get back to us in just a second. We are in a similar situation that Jesus was in toward the end of his life. And he knew that his crucifixion was near. And in the Matthew account of the gospel, he pulls aside disciple Peter. And he proclaims a new reality to Peter that came to be institutionalized in the way that Jesus envisioned the institutionalization of religion. He proclaimed to Peter, 
upon this rock I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus inherited a context where religion had become too formalized and not socially engaging enough. He had inherited a religion that had become too legalized trying to maintain the law at all costs in the fear of dread, if you so ever deviated in your sinful state, but nothing about the community and its transformation. He had inherited a popular religion that was obsessed with ritual. Every day, Every week, same time, same place, same station. But that is the very type of popular religion that Jesus, pastor, was upset about. And so he brought a new covenant to the world that freed us of the preoccupation with ritual freed us with the preoccupation of legalism freed us from the preoccupation of formalism he even had the audacity to be out healing people on the Sabbath not well dressed in fine raiment preaching in a mega church. We don't understand uh, this approach to religion, particularly by a man proclaiming to be the son of God. Jesus inaugurated a church to Peter that was to be decentralized and deinstitutionalized. That it was not about bourgeois culture. It was not about the perpetuation of privileged life for the upper classes. It was about making a statement to the world that God's will is primarily identified with the marginalized and the disinherited. In other words, Jesus engaged in a turning of the tables and brought about a religion that's altogether different than what he inherited. We have done the same thing as black folk. We had church before we had building. And we were responding to a, to a crisis of our dehumanization as slaves, and we created Brush Harbor religion. We snuck down to the edge of the plantation, yes, for release, but also to plot, strategize, to create a new covenant in a nation that prided itself on being a democracy for one race of people. Yes, sir. And it is that contradiction and that hypocrisy that in 2021, we are still faced with in a hell of fire. Yes. World. We understood that we didn't need bricks and mortar. We understood that when Jesus commissioned the church to Peter, he was not commissioning to Peter to build buildings. He was commissioning Peter to build a new world rooted in human liberation. Well, what happened? 
we have allowed ourselves to become institutionalized. Yes. We have fallen victim to formalism, to legalism, to ritual, to a theology that is racist, demagogic, dehumanizing, and repressive. Well, what do you mean, Dr. Singleton? They have you look it up for the fulfillment of promises of God. They have you looking down to consider the alternative if you don't fall in line with status quo religion. And the only place we're not looking is straight ahead. Mm. My Lord. To a hellified world that we are not engaging because we're too busy being ritualistic. And in doing so, we are serving uh, the interests of a racist status quo yeah, yeah. and not the interests of Jesus Christ yeah. and the church that he bequeathed to Peter and to us. They've got us spied on personal fulfillment. Thank you, God, for allowing me to get this Mercedes Benz. Thank you, God, for allowing me to buy this half-million-dollar home out in the suburbs, away from the marginalized. And I'm going to go to church Sunday and thank you even more for it. Thank you, God, for allowing me to join this 20,000-member church. Much bigger than my church in Lake City, them nothing happening Negroes. <laughs> nothing to come in our church, Harry, and see Patty LaBelle sitting in it. <laughs> nothing, Harry, to come in our church and see Barack Obama sitting in it. Nothing to come in our church and see Halle Berry in our church. We are a prestigious church, Harry, because that's where the celebrities flock. I've actually had people say that to me. And my response has always been the same. And your point would be. <laughs> because as far as I'm concerned, this country still considers those people Negro. Still Negroes. We see them on TV, but still Negroes. I want to say something else, but I won't since I'm in a church. Use them, Lord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yet you talking to me about a building. Malcolm said we don't catch hell because we are Baptists. We don't catch hell because we are Methodists. We don't catch hell because we are Episcopalians. We catch hell in a hellified world, Jesus. Because and solely because 
of the color of our skin. Try this on for size. Do you think that when Derek Chauvin had his neck on, had his knee on George Floyd's neck, do you think Derek Chauvin cared where George Floyd went to church? Do you think Derek Chauvin cared who George Floyd's pastor was? Do you think Derek Chauvin cared about how many members were in that church? Interchangeable parts. That could have been any of us that day but it was him do you think when the police entered the wrong apartment building and sprayed up Breonna Taylor's apartment that they cared when she went to church did they care whether she was Baptist or United Methodist I don't even think being a practicing Catholic would have saved Breonna Taylor. What is your point, Dr. Sand? My point very simply is this, Wesley Chapel. We have lost our way as a church. And we must find our way back to that original. Reason for being church. Find our way back. In essence, we have lost the hope of Jesus. And we have lost the trust of Jesus. And so now, we have to regain the hope of Jesus. And we have to regain the trust of Jesus. How do we do that, Dr. Singleton? I'm glad you asked. Yes, Jesus said, upon this rock I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus was not talking about a landmass. That's how we have lost our way. We think that we came to church this morning. We always think we leave home and come to church. But a church from its origins up to this moment has never been bricks and mortar. It has never been a building. It is meaningless without you and without me. That is the difference between formal religion and the new covenant that our Jesus Christ brings. Not brought, but brings because Jesus is still in the business of bringing hope and bringing trust if church becomes real, it becomes church in our heart. And so if you got up this morning coming to church to come here to be churchized, then you have missed the point altogether. We need a theological renaissance. You didn't need to come here to be churchized. This building becomes church when you walked in it and when I walked in it because we bring church in our heart. And it is to that heart that we must return. When Jesus was making that statement, he wasn't going out to find a land deed. When Jesus made that statement, he was talking to Peter. Not for Peter to go out and build a church. 
got enough of that. Peter is Petra, the rock. I'm building a church not on solid ground. I'm building a church on your back and your shoulders, Peter. And I am building it to put that church in your heart. That means that church in your heart doesn't mean you come to a building. If the gates of hell are prevailing against it, it means that you are not engaged in the hell you have encountered in your lifetime. And we have seen the benefits as a people when we don't get engaged the hellified elements in our society. When we don't engage the racist elements in our society and in the church. When we don't engage the sexist, hellified world in the society and in the church. When we don't make the unqualified commitment to poverty in a hellified world that make poor people think they're poor simply because they're inept. And then we go to church every Sunday and pay pastors hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to preach a doctrine that make us feel good about what we do to the poor. And so this place we call church a building is in collusion with the forces that be in this society to preach a meek and mild gospel to you. To keep you humble and to keep you quiet and to make you think that somehow that is equating with Jesus' life. Jesus was never quiet and humble. And so if church is real in your heart, then church will be real as you engage hell in the society. Our ancestors engaged their hellified condition and understood themselves to be at church because church was in their heart. Martin Luther King took the church in his heart to the world. Desmond Tutu took the church in his heart to the world. Nelson Mandela took the church in his heart to the world. Fannie Lou Hamer took the church in her heart to the world. And it is only when we take the church to the world in our hearts do we begin to make a difference in minimizing the hellified world we live in. This is why we are admonished to think that as a man thinks, so is he. As a woman thinks in her heart, so is she which means that we have an intimate connection with God that the world didn't give. And therefore the world could not take away. How do you know, pastor, as I go to my seat? When we go back to the verse above where Jesus commissions the church to Peter, there was a reason why he picked Peter to commission the church to. Peter said the world says that you are a sinner and that you are masquerading as the son of God. But Jesus turned the tables and put it right back to Peter and said, who do you say? <laughs> that I am. And Peter didn't say, I agree with them. Peter did not agree with the world. Peter understood that he was looking at something with the spiritual eye that the worldly and fleshy eye could not see. And he said, I am talking, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And because he was the son of the living God, he died a death like all of us and a very, very humiliating death at that. But, 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 since he came as the son of God, 
He showed us how we could overcome the power of death, the power of hell, that the gift of God gives all of us if we would have church in our heart. It is not something that you tell the world. It is something that you show the world. And we've had great leaders to show the world that we believe that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. I believe it. Those who came before me believe it, and I'm sure that you believe it as well. And so, Wesley Chapel, as I say to you, on your 136th anniversary, it is now time for us to regain Jesus' hope, regain Jesus' trust, shed the old covenant of comfortability, and pick up the new covenant of human transformation and liberation by taking church to a hellified world. And saying to the powers that be, your day is over, for I know of a God who sent a son into the world that I recognize not to be a mortal man, but the son of God. the Christ. He lives and because he lives I can live a redeemed existence knowing that death is not the end of my existence. Wesley Chapel happy anniversary happy 136 years and I hope for 136 years more until the consummation of the end of the time and the placement of God's reign in the universe. Thank you for listening. May peace and power forever be yours, and may God bless you. It's a time thing. I, you know, I, I just like to sing the song and go and, and, and run around the church and, 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 and you know, and just a just little thank you, Lord, a, a little, little something just to, woo! Hey, hey. Yes, uh, I feel good now. I feel good now. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord, what a word for the ages. Amen. I, I, I'm going to get some of that. Amen. How they say it at, 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 at the potter's house? By the tape. <laughs> Amen. Amen. What a good God we serve and what a God who's capable of preaching and a God who's capable of delivering.